Welcome everybody. Today we're joined by Johan to talk about the journey of a HTML page, uh, making the complex simple and sustainable again. Over to you. The idea here is to explain the big issues with, with the web and how we can make it sustainable again, because basically the web has always been designed to be sustainable. We kind of seem to have forgotten how to keep it that way. Um, and there we are. So first of all, a little step back, right? How do the web, how does the web actually work? Um, uh, the basics of that, so we can figure out where in all those steps where a web page actually goes from a server to a browser, we can intervene to make that process more sustainable and require less energy. Um, so starting with the beginning, um, what you should all know hopefully is that the web runs on HTTP, which is the protocol that, that makes content move from a server to a browser. Um, that protocol is the language, the communication language that the web uses. There are different versions of it, HTTP 1 and HTTP 2, which is not necessarily that important. There's a couple key aspects of that protocol that uh, increase sustainability on the internet uh, that are important to know about. Um, so starting with the beginning, I took a nice screenshot of the let's screen the web. Um, so this is, if you would go to this page uh, in your web browser, um, it would look a little bit like this and you would use a URL to refer to that page. In the very early days, this would have been a file, an HTML file that was sitting on a web server. So you had probably created that file using Notepad or Dreamweaver or front page, you would have uploaded it. It was what we call a static file. And I would go to that file and then I would see the result. That's how the web initially uh, was intended to, to be used. Things became a little bit more complex after. So what you need to remember is that we use a URL to refer to a location somewhere on the internet. And the result of that uh, we see in our browser. Um, so at the most basic level, we have the HTTP protocol and we have a URL. Uh, if our browser cannot find anything at that specific location, it will return a 404, which basically means it is an error saying, hey, I cannot find anything there. Uh, whatever you're trying to look for, it hasn't been found. Okay, so there's the basics. Now, this is where we are now and how the web works today in most cases. And I'll try to keep this as simple as possible, but there's a couple of elements here. First, on the left, you see your browser. The browser could also be an email client. We often forget that we're also browsing the web through our email clients when we receive email, specifically HTML email. In the middle, we see the server. Um, and on the right, we see everything that is responsible, this part here, everything that is responsible to generate our web page. So what happens here is, and I'm using the example of WordPress because most of site, a lot of sites today are using WordPress. So I'm, I'm using the example of PHP. What's happening here is they have a web server, this part. This is gonna receive the request for our specific web page. And this web page is gonna be generated. So this is where we're starting to talk about dynamic websites, right? So this web server and this part here is WordPress is gonna generate the HTML on the fly and is gonna return that to the browser. It's gonna go all the way back. 80% of websites today use this process where you're typing a URL in your browser the request is being sent through a server, ends up in an Apache web server. There is a PHP application running here. That PHP application generates the HTML page. What should happen in this whole process and what in the most cases, I'm gonna go back to that later, doesn't happen is there should be caching here. Uh, here you can cache and here you can cache to optimize this process and make it more sustainable. In most cases, that isn't being done. It slows down uh, the website, but it also means that more energy is being wasted because each time you type a URL, if you go back, each time you type this URL in your browser and you go to this blog post, this page, because this is a WordPress site, is being regenerated by WordPress on the fly. So if 10,000 people visit this page, then 10,000 times this page will be generated. 
Okay. So this could also happen through an email client, but a little bit more about that later because we're also visiting and, vi and, and visualizing marketing emails, which contain HTML in our email clients. Now, there's a lot of talk about static websites versus dynamic websites. And there's a lot that can be said about that. But what I want you to remember is that in case of a static website, um, there is no dynamic process generating their page. There is no WordPress application that is going to generate the page. The page has already been pre-generated. It is static. It was uploaded to, to the server, just like you would upload a file to your file system, um, just in the same way. Uh, if you would upload a PDF file to your computer, that file is what we call static. Nothing is generating that file, it's there. In case of a dynamic web server, the web page is being generated on the fly. That's the process that I just explained. Uh, examples are WordPress, Joomla, basically uh, more than 60% of websites today are using a dynamic process to generate the web page. And this is where a lot of optimizations are possible because this process is being run for each request that we are making to that page. Okay, now how can you optimize that process? Uh, this is HTTP in three minutes. HTTP is a protocol that creates a, a conversation between the client, the browser and the server. Um, this is how HTTP can converse and work with caching. What you see on the left here is a request for file. This is just slash file. Uh, this is just something on the web server that we're requesting. The server is gonna send this back and it's gonna say 200. Okay, here it is. I understood your request and I'm gonna give it, and, I, and I'm gonna give the HTML page back to you. The length of whatever I'm sending back is 1024 uh, uh, bytes, but more important, the cache control here. This page that I'm sending you back is going to be valid for 120 seconds, which is two minutes. So you can store this page for two minutes and you can do whatever you want with it. You don't need to come back to me as a server to re-request it. Uh, I'm telling you that this page is going to be valid for two minutes. And second, we're sending an e-tag with this page, which is a unique identifier for this page um, that the browser can use to go back to figure out if this page has changed, yes or no. And this is the next step. So this is your initial request. You type in slash file or slash blog post sustainable web, you get an HTML page back and it contains this additional information in the HTTP protocol. Now, you already have this file in your browser and you go again to it. For example, you browsed through the blog post yesterday and you're gonna go back to that blog post today. Ideally, you don't want the server to regenerate the page anymore. You want the server to not need to do any work because you already went to the site and you already have the page in your browser cache because, because there has been caching information being sent. So what could happen is, is that your browser basically says, oh, but I have this page in my cache, okay? You gave it to me yesterday, um, but the two minutes have passed because we're a day later. So I'm not 100% sure anymore if this page is actually still valid. Can I still show this page to you? Or maybe the page has been changed. So what the browser then will do is it will say, oh, but wait a minute, I have this e-tag here, this identifier for this page. I'm going to send this e-tag to the server, which is what I'm doing here. I'm gonna do get, get me this file again, but I'm sending the e-tag with it. And I'm basically saying if null match. If nothing matches this e-tag, then you need to send me uh, a new result. But if there is a match, then the server is gonna go like, yeah, I can find a match for this. I have a page in my local cache that has this e-tag, basically meaning this thing exists here. It hasn't changed. So I'm going to send a 304 not modified back. I'm basically gonna reply and say, hey, I have this. And the page that I have is the same one that you have. Right, So I don't need to regenerate it again. I don't need to boot up WordPress, start up WordPress and generate the page again. I don't need to do that because I know that the page is the same. I'm just gonna reply with a 304 not modified. And this specific re reply here is only a couple of bytes of data that is being sent back from the server to the browser. 
This is how the ACDP protocol by definition is sustainable. Um, because if you have already requested something, you can go back and ask and say, hey, did this change? And then the, bra the, the, the server basically comes back and says, hey, no, it didn't change. Use whatever you have. The problem is that this specific process, which is part of the ACP protocol, isn't used in most cases. We're always resending that page and regenerating that page. If there are any questions, let me know. I'm trying to go through this step by step. So this is um, the blog post of the Green Web. When I go to the URL, the URL is below. Then at the right side, you see the headers. So there's a lot of stuff happening there. There are two headers that are important. The first header is uh, saying dynamic. And then below, you also see a header saying missed. Those are two cache headers. This is basically the server saying, I'm regenerating this page dynamically. I ha don't have anything cached. I cannot figure out if this page has changed, yes or no. I cannot do that for you. The only thing that I can do is I can generate it again and then give the result back to you. That's what happening on most WordPress sites, on most Joomla sites, basically on most sites on the internet today. Uh, there is a lack of, of caching. Um, this is caching of the actual HTML page. We do have caching for images and JavaScript, but we don't have caching for HTML itself. Okay, so what is the result of that? The result of that is that those web pages need to uh, travel from the server to the client. Uh, what you see here on the left is uh, a test that I made uh, with a tool uh, to check how long it takes to transfer a page from the server because it's generated again and again and again for each request to a browser in specific regions of the world. And what you can see is that the server for Climate Action Tech is somewhere in London, I think, because you have like, or somewhere in Europe, close to Amsterdam, London maybe, you have like a, a very quick uh, time to first byte, which means the time that it takes to receive the first byte from the server, it's about 50 milliseconds. But the farther you go from that server, the further you go from that server, the more time it starts to take. So in Tokyo, it takes approximately half a second to receive a reply from your server. Um, that's a little bit unfortunate because it takes time, which basically means the site becomes slower and it takes more energy to send all those bytes across the internet all the way to Tokyo. So the, aver the, the average here is approximately 300 milliseconds. So where can we optimize and where can you make a website and design a website to be more sustainable? You can start by making it more sustainable by not regenerating it again and then again each time it's requested. And second, you can make it more sustainable by not sending that data from the server in London to Tokyo for each request. There's a, there's a better way of doing that. We'll talk a little bit about that later, which also involves caching. This is why caching is important, All right? And then second, so this is how the network works. This is how ACDP works. We're sending data from the server to the client. We're generating HTML. Now, the HTML itself is also something uh, that, that we can optimize with the amount of information that we're sending from the server to the client is also something that we can optimize. And there's a whole lot of things that we can do. And I'm just gonna focus on one thing, uh, which is actually the images that can be embedded within HTML. Like HTML can do a lot of things, right? This is the definition of HTML. If you go to the specification on the website uh, of the W3.org, which is the people that are building this pack. But very important, an HTML document is a structured document with inline graphics. So we can contain graphics in that HTML file. Now, let's try to define the problem. So what do we remember? We use the HTTP protocol to transfer data from the server to the browser. That protocol includes a communication system that allows us to actually not need to transfer all that data all the time. And the data that we transfer are HTML documents that can contain images and other information. So what's the problem? The first problem is, is that the amount of data that we transfer is really, really large and is going up year by year. 
Uh, in 2010, the um, medium web page was about 500 kilobytes of data. Uh, 476 in 15 November 2010. This is data from the HTTP archive, which is a website run by Google that uh, tracks uh, data over the years. This is really interesting. So today, the amount is two megabytes. That has increased fivefold since 2010. So we're transferring an enormous amount of data each time we are requesting a web page. And this is a single web page that we're browsing. Second problem, 50% of the data for that web page are images. Uh, in 2010, 225 kilobytes. Today, we're averaging at around one megabyte of data that is actually images contained in our web page. So half of our problem are our images. Now, this is not only a problem, or images are not only a problem for websites, they're also a problem for emails and newsletters, specifically marketing newsletters that are visual HTML uh, emails. So more than half of the world population is using, is using email since 2019. There are actually more people using email than people using the internet and browsing websites. The number of worldwide email users will expect it to grow to 4.3 billion by the end of uh, in two years time from now. And we're sending an enormous amount of emails. This is data that I could find from 2019. Uh, we're forecasted to send 350 billion uh, emails per year um, in 2023. And the problem with emails is, is that the click rate for an email, because this is what marketeers want, right? Marketeers want that you click on the links in, in your email. That's the whole goal of sending you the email. We want you to come to our website. We want to, you, to, you, you to read our information. The click rate in an email increases by 42% if there's an image in the email. So what we're seeing is if you, if you look at the, um, let's call it the sustainability uh, of emails, it's actually even worse. An email weighs on average 45 kilobytes, which is almost two times as much as an HTML web page. But there are more than two and a half times more images in emails, or the size of the images in emails is two and a half times bigger. So the amount of data that we're sending through email and the amount of bandwidth that, that is being wasted by images in those emails. And of course, the amount of energy that that requires is even substantially bigger than with websites. All right, so one of the big problems, sustainability problems on the internet today, if you're talking about how can you reduce energy, uh, energy uh, consumption of the internet itself, is reducing images and the size of images, the amount of images, anything that has to do with images. So I'm going to focus on that in the next couple of slides. First of all, one more. We talked about how the internet works and the fact that web pages are dynamically generated. Well, 60% of all websites today uses a content management system, a CMS, which is an application that can dynamically generate a web page. WordPress is a example of such a CMS and WordPress today is, since actually this month is being used on 40% of all the websites in the world. Together, that's three out of five websites that use a CMS, which are where, where the web pages are dynamically generated. So at least 60%. And if I take the top five systems, then all of them actually lack caching out of the box. So none of these systems are out of the box configured to cache. All of these systems are set up in such a way that you go to, uh, to a URL, it will render the web page again for you. Of course, you can solve all that, but it's not something that is done out of the box. Okay, so when the solution is simple, God is answering, let's, let's hope so. I have a couple of Einstein quotes in, in, in the middle. Uh, so defining solutions, right? Um, if, if you look at those two problems, the first problem being that um, by default, the web can be cached, but it's not because most of the applications we use are not doing that by default and people are not setting it up. And second, we use 
we, we use images in an unsustainable way. Our images are too big. So the ha half of our website content or web content are images. Those are the two problems. So if we could reduce the page weight and specifically the amount of images or the image size in our websites by 30% and increase the amount of cached requests by 30%, the web would become a whole lot more sustainable, right? It's, this is, would be an enormous amount. And that's not that hard to do. So following slides are a couple of examples of solutions without going into too much technical detail, how you can do this. First of all, images. How can you make the size, the amount of the image size that, that sits in your web page? how can you take it down? By using a different image format. We all know about JPEG, uh, PNG, um, maybe about GIF, SVG, which are image formats that we use when we as designers create, create images. A couple of years ago, Google created a different format called WebP, which is a modern image format that is specifically built for the web. And WebP is about 26% smaller in size compared to a PNG and can be 25 to 30 percent to 34 percent smaller than, than than JPEG images. So only using WebP for your images would already reduce the amount of image data that we send around by 30 percent. Um, it has taken a little bit of time for WebP to be adopted by all modern browsers, but that is the case today. Even uh, Safari, the latest version of Safari. Uh, started supporting WebP. So the only browser that in older versions doesn't support it 100% yet is Safari, but for the rest, all browsers do. Um, so this is a very important optimization step to make a website more sustainable, simply using WebP for your images. Now, how do you do that if you already have a lot of images on your site? Do you need to like open them up in an editor and save them. And there's a lot of minimal work in, involved in that process that wouldn't be useful and it would be too much of a hurdle uh, to adopt uh, this format. And there is a solution for that, which is called an image CDN. CDN stands for Content Delivery Network. Basically, this is an application running on the internet that can automatically change the format of an image. It can, base, it, it can not only resize the image and say, okay, I want this big image to be smaller, uh, but it can also change the format of the image. For example, by what you see here is, this is my doc image. And if I do question mark format is WebP, then this content delivery network, this image CDM will change the format of this image to WebP. This allows you to change, to resize images on the fly. And it also allows you to change the format of an image on the fly. Now, there are many other things that this can do. Uh, for example, you can say, change the quality of this image. You can do something like quality is auto, where um, it's going to reduce the quality to further reduce the file size. Because we're not only trying to use a different file format, we're also trying to reduce the overall size of the image. We don't really need all those very big images uh, that we make with our mobile phone or, or with our uh, with our cameras. So then you can say size is 300 wide and 400 height. So make this image smaller for me, which means that the file size will also consider, become considerably smaller. An image CDN. There are commercial players on the market that offer this functionality. Uh, if you type image CDN in Google, you will find a lot. There's a link below uh, from Google uh, with more information about image CDNs. There are also solutions that you can install yourself and there are in in WordPress, also plugins that can do this in WordPress itself. All right, so you don't then need a different application for it. Okay, so this is great. We changed the format of the image and we made it smaller. That's great, but this is not, this is already an optimization and we can take this a step further because our web page will be viewed on different devices. It's gonna be viewed on a big, uh, desktop device with a very big monitor, could be a very big monitor, but it could also be a smaller mobile phone or an iPad or another tablet. Um, the image that we need for those devices will differ. On the iPhone, we need a much smaller image than uh, on the iMac or on the desktop. 
Uh, there is a technology for that uh, that is part of a browser, which is called responsive images. Without explaining it in too much technical detail, what basically is happening is the browser will decide which image to use based on the context, based on the size of the screen. So what you see here is this would normally be an image tag in HTML. What basically says is this is the name of the image file. So load this. If we load this on an iPhone, we could be loading a very, very big image, which is 800 pixels wide, while our iPhone is only 400 pixels wide. So we don't need that very big image. We need a smaller one. So then you can do this. You can basically say, hey, uh, I have multiple images here. I have an image which is 480 pixels wide. I have one that is 800 pixels wide. Now, if your screen has a maximum width of 600, uh, then use the image that is 480 pixels wide. So for the iPhone, use the smaller image. And for the other two, use the bigger image, right? So these are responsive images. The browser is going to decide which image to use. Now you're gonna go, okay, this is really great, but now I need to start creating multiple images. Like how do we solve that problem? Well, then we go back here to our image CDN. Our image CDN can create images on the fly in multiple dimensions. So this kind of URL we would use for our image here so that we can create multiple images on the fly. We can basically say, I have a base image, which is really big. Uh, I'm going to change it to a WebP image and I'm gonna change the size depending um, on where it's being uh, shown. And that happens on, on the fly. You don't need to worry about it anymore. The result is that the amount of data for your images goes down drastically because your images are adapted to the context that they're being viewed in. Okay, great. Now. We change the format of the image to WebP, which is already 30% better. Then we change the size of the image to smaller images because we don't need very big ones. And in the last step, we don't need to load all the images on the web page because specifically on a mobile phone, there is a very small screen here. This is a phone. There's a very small screen and not all those images are gonna be visible right away. I need to scroll down to see the images. So how can we solve that problem? Well. Normally when the browser will load the HTML page, it's gonna load everything in that HTML page. That means it's gonna load all the images. So we need to tell the browser that it doesn't need to do that. It should only load them when the image is either visible or about to become visible. And this is what we call lazy loading. Um, this is very easy to do um, since a couple of months because Google implemented, well, the web standards, we implemented a web standard called image lazy loading and Google Chrome is the first one to implement it. So you can do something like image loading is lazy. What happens now is, is that on the left, you see a picture, uh, you, see, you see the picture without lazy loading. So in total, there are four images. The total of those is 160 kilobytes. On the right, you see that only the first two are gonna be loaded because the third one, is a little is is going to become visible. It's not visible yet. Now, the moment that I start scrolling this page on my phone, the fourth one and the fifth one would would also be uh, be loaded. But if I'm not scrolling, the images are not loaded and the data isn't transferred. And the simple way of doing that is simply adding loading is lazy. This is something that Climate Tech website already does. By the way, I checked that, so this is already there. Um, the only disadvantage right now is that only Google Chrome supports this and other browsers are picking up. Um, you can also uh, implement this by a little bit of JavaScript so that you can get the same behavior across all browsers. So then there's a little bit of JavaScript that you need to put uh, in your site that handles this for you, but down the road, all browsers will start supporting this and images can be lazy loaded. You can do the same thing. Also for videos, for example, right? It doesn't need to be an image. It can also be a video uh, that you lazy load. So same problem with videos. If you put a video in, in a web page, it will automatically be loaded until, unless you tell the browser not to by lazy loading it. This reduces the amount of data again by quite a bit because we're talking here about approximately 60 to 70% less uh, no, sorry, uh, 40 to 50% less. We're gonna go from 160 kilobytes to 90 kilobytes in, in this case. Okay, so that's all about images. So 
we lazy load our images, we generate our images on the fly and we, we reduce the size and we use a different format, which is more optimized for, for the web. This can take your images down from one megabyte to 250 kilobytes. If you go down, I think you can easily get a, a, a reduction of 70% on that uh, on, on a web page if, if, if you do this. The second one, which we talked about was the amount of data that we sent over the network and the fact that we always need to go back to our server to get the data, the, the, the HTML and the images and then send it back to the client. And we only have one server. Well, most people only have one server. <laughs> Some people have more money and more resources. They have more servers, but, but most people only have one server. Uh, so the requests are always gonna go back to that, to that server. You can solve that problem with a CDN which is a content delivery network. It's like having a, an army of servers divided across the world. Um, and instead of retrieving the HTML page from your own server, it's gonna be retrieved from the content delivery network. So if I'm in Melbourne and I'm gonna visit Climate Action Tech, then the web page is not gonna come all the way from the server in London. It's gonna come from the CDN server in Melbourne. Now for this to work, all these servers need to be able to communicate with each other, right? Um, and they can only do that if caching is available because what you're basically doing is you're caching the HTML page in the server in Melbourne. If the caching is off and the server, the, the origin server, the initial server that generated the page basically says, hey, I don't want anybody on the network to cache this. This is not allowed. All the requests need to come back to me. Then all the requests will go back, but then we're wasting an enormous amount of bandwidth. And uh, it takes a longer time to actually send the data over, right? Um, the problem here <coughs> is that like, this is an example. This is our site. The advantage of this is that if you use a CDN, the average time, go, your average time to, to your first byte goes down. So the time it takes, to get the first byte back goes down to approximately 50 milliseconds. Remember, we're coming from 300 milliseconds without this. So the web pages are being served close to where the client is requesting them. We need less energy to send the page to the client and we have a faster website as a result. The problem is that most CDNs, actually all CDNs are not configured to cache HTML they're configured to cache CSS and JavaScript. They're configured to cache and images. They're configured to cache static assets because they know how to cache those. The server is giving them enough information to do that. Um, so you need to make changes to your WordPress site to make sure that your CDN also caches your HTML. And this is the step that is forgotten in a lot of cases or is, isn't being done. It's not that hard to do, right? There's enough tutorials out there to help you do that, but it's something that is forgotten. There is yeah. one cat. So go ahead. Um, I just want to jump in because we're near, nearing the 15 minute to the end mark. Um, I don't know if we can speed up quite quickly or, or start sure. to wrap so we can, we want to give everyone the opportunity to ask some questions. Yeah. Um, okay. So maybe okay, give us can, another minute to, to wrap and then we can ask some questions. I'll or... go quickly down to do the rest. So this is an example of how we do it on our site where you see the CDN cache in action. And then you see here the cache status, it's saying hit and hit. So this page is coming from the cache. It's coming from the CDN. It's not coming from the server again. Um, and then I'm actually there to wrap up. Um, so how do you sell this, right? How do you sell these improvements? Because it's really hard to convince people about, okay, sustainable web design, um, carbon, the environment, like it's important for a group of people and it's very easy to talk about it. Like people in our community, it's easy to talk to them about it, but for a lot of others, it's, it's a lot harder. Now, in a sense, this is a win-win. All the changes that you make to make your website more sustainable, to reduce the amount of images and to make and to, uh, to send less data over the network are also going to make the site faster. It's also going to make the hosting cheaper and it's also going to make the site more search engine optimized. So whatever you're looking for, um, there is always gonna be a win-win in this. 
um, if your customer or your client or your owner or whoever doesn't believe in uh, the carbon emissions and optimizing the carbon emissions, he's very certainly going to believe in, okay, a faster website means more people visiting our site. Uh, a more optimized website means cheaper hosting. Those are things that you can definitely sell to them. And then finally, um, on the internet, less is more. Like making the web more sustainable is not only an, a technical effort. It's not only how do I make that site more sustainable? How do I, how do I re reduce the image size? Or how do I make it more cacheable? It's even more about thinking about the content that you create. Uh, we have created this sort of uh, web where everybody needs to duplicate content and have it under its own domain, right? There's an enormous amount of marketing material and enormous amount of emails being sent on a daily basis for, to get attention about what we're doing online. A simple solution is to simply create less articles, send less newsletters and create less noise, which in overall will make the web a lot more sustainable. So that was it. Uh, there's a case study on Joomla tools, which is the blog post that we uh, wrote for uh, the Let's Screen the Web campaign, which we can find at joomlatools.com slash blog slash developer slash sustainable web design. Uh, and we will also tweet it, uh, the, the link so you can find it there. This explains how we do all this for our own sites and you can test your own site to see how well we're doing. Um, you can find me at Twitter, Facebook and GitHub. <laughs>